Okay. Uh, in this lecture, uh, the topic is integer partitions, or simply just partitions. So when I say partitions, it will mean an integer partition. All right, definition. So these are very, very uh, important concept in mathematics, not only in combinatorics, but also in number theory, uh, representation theory, symmetric functions, etc. Uh, an integer partition of n, n is a non-negative non integer, is a weakly decreasing sequence uh, usually denoted using uh, Greek letter lambda, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda L, decreasing sequence of uh, positive integers uh, whose sum uh, summing to n. whose sum is n. So in other words, lambda 1 greater than or equal to lambda 2 greater than or equal to dot 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 greater than or equal to lambda L, which is at least 1. And the sum is equal to n. So in this case, we denote by, uh, in this way, denote, this means lambda is a partition of n. And, and this n is the size of lambda. And uh, this is uh, denoted in this way. The absolute value of n means the size of n. So this and this um, are kind of similar. And L here, the number of things here, uh, each ai is called a part of lambda. And L is the number of um, L of lambda. It's, the, it's called the length of lambda. And defined to be equal to the number of partitions, uh, parts of la lambda. In this case, in our case, L. The L of lambda is the number of parts. Uh, example. 4, 3, 1 is a part partition of 8. And there is uh, a very simple way to visualize this Young diagram. You just put boxes, four boxes, because the first element is 4, and 3 below, 1 below, left adjusted array of squares so that i throw has lambda i squares. And Ferris diagram, these are in fact the same, but I think Ferris diagram, the only difference is using dots. But they are exchangeable. Sometimes people say this is Ferris diagram or Young diagram. They are, you can just, you can say that they are the same. Only use, it's more common to represent Young diagram using square and Ferris diagram using dots, but obviously they are equivalent. So, all right, uh, and sometimes integer partition is also represented by. Uh, specifying the number of parts equal to i. So uh, lambda, there are two different ways of writing this. It's also written as 1 to the m1, 2 to the m2, dot, dot, dot. This is just notation, where 
mi is the number of parts equal to i. So for example, uh, let's say lambda equals of 7, 7, 5, 5, 5, 4, 2, 1, 1. That this can also be written in this way. We have two ones, so 1 to the 2, 2, 0, uh, 2 to the 1, 3, we don't have 3, 4, 1, 4, 3, 5, 0, 6, uh, 2, 7, and 0, 8, etc. So by omitting this, we also write this in this way. They mean the same thing. This all mean the same thing. Because what really matters in uh, your partition is how many parts are there which are equal to i. So sometimes this is uh, more useful or sometimes this is more useful. So you will use sometimes this or sometimes this, etc. And P of n is the number of partitions of n. Empty partition is also considered as a partition. Partition of zero. It's a partition of zero. Nothing. So P of zero is one because there is one partition which is zero. Uh, which is a partition of zero. P one equals one. P two equals two. We computed this before, right? Okay, uh, I already mentioned in uh, last week that P of n does not have a known explicit simple formula, but their generating function is very simple. So proposition. Oh, mm, okay. By generating function for a sequence, I, I told you something like this. Uh, in the last lecture today, uh, I used variable x for generating function or formal power series, uh, but in partition theory, it's more common to use q. So usually called q series. This is equal to uh, i greater than or equal to 1, 1 over 1 minus 1 over yeah, I proved this last time very briefly, but let me give you a more uh, detailed proof. First of all, is this a valid generating function? That is the first question that you have to ask. Is this a valid uh, formal power series? Because it's an infinite product, you have to uh, check for it. But it is, because uh, if you rewrite this, we know that this is a ge geometric series, so it's uh, this is the same, 2i, 3i. But now, uh, think about the coefficient of x to the n for a fixed n. We all need to consider the first n factors because if i is bigger than n, the smallest non-constant uh, non term will have already more than q to the i. So we only need to look at the first n factors, which is, of course, finite. So it is a form of power series. Uh, it is OK. It's good. So let's prove this. So left-hand side is the generating function for uh, the number of partitions, the sequence of uh, the number of partitions, but that is basically the same as this. This all partition. You add all partition for all partition. You add the size of n. This is the same as this because q to the n will be added exactly p of n times. You know because if you really want to be very precise, because this is the same as this uh, number of lambda 
which is a partition of n. Right? So we have in, infinite sum. When you have a form, if you want to make this as a formal power series, you just collect uh, terms which have the same uh, power of Q. So if you collect Q to the n, you will have this many Q to the n over here, which is exactly number of partitions of n, which is just the definition of this. So now, we, I want to uh, divide this into, I, I'm going to write this in a different way. So in the previous slide, we saw that lambda is a, if lambda is a partition, we can always write lambda in this way, m1, m2, by uh, saying the number of parts, q to the lambda. Because partition can always be written in this way. But what is this? If lambda is written in this way, what is this? How can you compute the size of your partition? You just add all the parts, right? But now let's uh, rewrite this. Mm. So how many ones are there? M1. For 1, we will add 1. So it's going to be 1 times M1. For 2, we have M2 twos. So we have to add 2 M2 times. So 2 times M2. Plus for 3, the same. Oh, by the way, is this an infinite sum? Uh, it is not quite. Because lambda is a partition, that means this is finite sequence. We, even though I wrote this in you know, an like infinite sequence, but it's going to be zero after some point. So it's, it'll be a finite sum, so it's, it's OK. But now, what is m1 and m2? What is the condition for m1? There is no condition. It can be anything. For any M1, any M2, any choice of M1, any choice of M2, you will get exactly one partition once you've made choices for all of this. So this can be written this way. M1 can be anything from 0 to infinity. M2 can be anything from 0 to infinity. Infinite things like this. And uh, Q to the 1 M1. But they are independent of each other. Here, M1 and M2, if you have set, chosen like 5 M1, you don't have any condition on M2. doesn't matter how many ones there are. You can select M, uh, number of two, two uh, parts equal to 2 freely. So it is basically equal to this. You can rewrite. because we can separate this. But now what? Uh, this is nothing but a uh, formal power, uh, geometric series. So it's 1 over 1 Q, 1 if you want. Oh no. We don't need this anymore. So this is equal to this geometric series. This is equal to this geometric series. This is equal to this geometric series, etc. Which is exactly the right hand side. Sorry, yeah. You fixed n and calculated each lambda for n in the above, but you stopped it right below the right below that. So it is uh, is it possible because Uh, you mean this step? Yeah. No, oh, yeah, that's a good question. Because I'm a little confused too. <laughs> so why? Why can we do this? Think about it for uh, for a while. Mm. Let's think about that. So this is okay. You just write everything here. Here. But what 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 does this mean? Basically, what, what is this? Yeah, so here, we have to ask that question. What is this, by the way? <laughs> infinite many, basically it's infinitely many product. Mm, but 
Mm, so, okay. It's a formal power series. Formal power series. Meaning, so for instance, here is a formal power series. Again, let, let's go back to this again. We have infinite uh, product. When you expand the product, you select one term in each factor, and then you multiply them together to get one single term in the product, in the expansion of the product. What if, just imagine, you choose this every time for every i. So you choose, in the first factor, you choose q to the 1. In the second factor, you choose q to the 2, q to the 3, q to the 4, etc. What do you get if you multiply them? to the infinity. We don't have something like that in uh, formal power series. So in formal power series, we don't select those. So in formal power series, when we have infinite product like this, we select uh, non, um, how can I say? We select only finitely many terms which are not equal to one. That's basically the definition of this, I would say. You have to select only a finitely many terms which are not equal to 1, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. So the here is the same. Although we have, it, it, it is infinite product, but you have to, in this, there are only finitely many uh, non-zero MIs. That's what I meant over here. In that sense, uh, this makes sense. It is, it is okay as a formal power series, and this is just the, uh, this uh, is another this is the same another way of writing this. And now we can e express everything as a geometric series like this. Yeah. So here it must be finite. Only here, uh, finitely many. Uh, non-zero mi because we don't have a partition like this this is not a partition you know one to the say two two this is this is not a partition this should not be or in here so we have to uh, ignore this so only we have to select finitely many non-zero terms here so in that sense this is okay and then we can go uh, this step this step Other question? In other words, you can say everything should be done by computer because computer can only do finite things. Even though it can compute very quickly, it cannot do uh, infinite, it cannot compute uh, infinite things. So this is the proof, or formal proof, of this. The formal power series is okay. It does have a uh, radius of convergence, I think. Uh, radius of convergence is one, so we can plug in some number here, but we will not do this uh, in my, my lecture. Okay, uh, for a partition lambda, the conjugate or transpose of lambda uh, denoted, usually denoted lambda prime is, uh, I'm going to define this using the uh, example just dots, let's use dots, it's uh, easier. It's uh, defined as follows. One example is better than uh, a lot of words. You just flip this diagram along this line, diagonal line. So. 
Okay? So transpose of three, two, uh, four, three, one is equal to three, two, two, one. Very simple proposition. Uh, I should have written this earlier than this, but number of partitions of n with at most k parts is equal to number of number of partitions of n with uh, largest part or every part less than or equal to k. Can you see the proof of this? Yeah, the proof is basically this. If you use the conjugate, conjugate of this will be this. You know, if there are like k, Less, if, if this is less than or equal to k, this part will be less than or equal to k. So that's the proof. Very simple. But if you don't use uh, this kind of Ferris diagram, it can be not that easy. Any question about this proof? Proof, I mean data conjugate. All right. Let P uh, less than or equal to K N be the number of partitions of N with at most uh, k parts, or equivalently, largest part less than or equal to k, because they have the same number. Okay. Then the generating function of this is also quite simple. Less than or equal to k. In fact, this is immediate from the previous generating f function formula. Instead of going to infinity, we have we need only k, because uh, here, if you remember, this is the geometric series. Selecting one term corresponded to having that many parts equal to i. But if we, only, uh, we are only allowed to have parts less than or equal to k, we cannot have i bigger than k. So we go from, i go from 1 to k. So this is, proof is basically the same if you use this uh, definition. All right? And lambda is called self-conjugate. If yeah, it is equal to its conjugate. So example uh, this is self conjugate. If you take a conjugate, you get the same thing. They are symmetric or along this line. Mm. Cor uh -huh. There is a very simple bijection between self-conjugate uh, partitions and partitions with odd parts only, a distinct odd parts. Uh, okay. Let's see if I want to do this right now. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Uh, 
Suppose you read this, what is this partition? 5, 3, 3, 1, 1. This represents this. Uh, and then let me uh, construct another partition by reading dots in this way, in this like hook shape. How many dots in this first hook? Nine. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So 9, let me use 1, 2, 3. 1. This is in fact a one-to-one -one correspondence. Whenever you, uh, I have to specify this, this is partition in, with distinct outputs. Meaning uh, you don't have any repetition. Distinct means they are all distinct. Odd means they are all odd integers. Whenever you have this, you can construct this back by uh, folding by, uh, this like I guess, this hook. Because this is an odd integer, it always can be uh, represented as a hook. And because they are all distinct, if you make combine the hooks, then it, it's going to be a valid uh, Ferris diagram. So the, cor the thing is, the proposition number of self conjugate partitions of n is equal to number of partitions of n into distinct odd parts. Into something means the parts are all distinct and odd. This gives a bijection to that. Everyone okay? Now uh, let me define another class, two, two more classes of partitions. P sub distinct of n, number of partitions of n with distinct parts. And P odd a number of partitions of n with odd parts. For instance, uh, p distinct of say 5. Let's compute this. How many partitions of 5 are there with distinct part? 5, uh, 4, 1, 3, 2. Are there more? Just these are all partitions of 5 into distinct parts. So it's going to be 3. P odd. Write 5 as a sum of uh, odd integers. 5 or 3, 1, 1 or 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And there are 3. They are always the same. This is a theorem. P distinct n is equal to p odd n. I'm going to give you uh, several proofs of this. There are many interesting proofs of this. So The first proof will be using generating function. Yeah, this is uh, one of the useful features of generating function. Very easy if you, sometimes, especially for partitions, generating function techniques are um, most useful. Compute the generating function for this, and compute the generating function for this, and compare them, and then if they are, they are the same, we can conclude that the coefficients are the same. So, this is the generating function for this sequence. Let's compute this. We will compute two generating functions. What is this? Just imagine the proof that I showed you. For distinct part, for each i, for uh, partitions with no restrictions, we had 
uh, free choice to select the number of parts equal to i. For i can appear, in your partition, i can appear zero times or one time, two times, three times, any time you want. But what about this? Distinct partition. So, all right, man. I mean, so without any condition, we will have this. Or in other words, we would have, with no condition, we would have this. Because I can be, I can appear in any time. Zero, one, two, etc. But in distinct part, how many times can I appear? Yeah. It may, it may not appear, but if it appears, it has to appear exactly once. It cannot appear more than once. That means these are out. So, oh. so basically, that's the proof. This is the ge generating function for the distinct part. Very easy. All right? It can appear zero times or just one time. Not else. Not uh, nothing else. Well, now, what about this? Now we have restrictions on the so uh, on uh, the value of the part. In the usual uh, parti the partition with no condition, I can be anything. I can be one. Part one can appear. Part two can appear, etc. But here, part two cannot appear because we only want to have uh, odd parts. So instead of ha having all i, we we'll only need uh, just odd integers. So if we're, if we write this, it's going to be all parts, but if you write this, it only we will uh, consider all odd parts. So this is the definition. This is it. Now, we computed the generating function for one sequence and another sequence, but they look different. But if we can show that they are indeed the same, then we can prove this. So how can we show that they are the same? Very easy if you can believe me. So let's uh, uh, start from this. Here, this is equal to, uh, I don't know if I want to start from here, but. Yeah, yeah I just rewrote this. I'm gonna multiply uh, this and this. Yeah, this is one, so it's it's fine to multiply this. Now, what happens is this. Let's look at the denominator. For every i, we have one minus q to the two i minus one, one minus q to the two i. That means every integer, say k, can appear because it can be either odd integer or uh, even integer. So. Okay, let me write this. Because here, every i, integer i can appear, either even or odd. What about this? Okay. Now, this also appears here. I mean, no, no, no. If, if, we, yeah, if we cancel this, we get the same thing. Now, I'm going to factor this out. This is equal to, right? Yeah, and then now you see, you can cancel this to get this, which is equal to this. So you, we have just showed that their generating functions are exactly the same. So their generating functions are the same, that means the coefficient of x to the n are the same. But these are their coefficients, so they have to be the same. So if, they are, if the generating functions are the same, the sequences are, of course, the same. So that's the proof of this. It was very easy because we just used the same argument twice, and then you did a little bit of simple computation. But everything done here is formal.
we didn't do anything that uh, anything from outside of this lecture. We didn't use any fact that you, it's outside. You have to be check. You have to be able to see that everything is okay, even though we had infinite many cancellation. That is okay. You have to convince yourself that this cancellation is fine. But if you want to really check whether this is okay or not, just ask yourself this question. Can you do this in finite times? Everything can be done in finite time. And compare, if you want to, for instance, if you want to check whether this equality is really true, formally, all you need to do is to compute x to the n, coefficient of x to the n, or q to the n, and coefficient of q to the n. If they are the same for every n, then they are the same as general formal power series. That's how we do in formal power series. Any question? Okay, so this is one proof. Another proof is using uh, proof. This, uh, maybe say two. This is called uh, Sylvester's bijection. By there is a bijective proof. There's uh, bijection. A very famous map in uh, partition theory. I'm going to construct a map from odd parts to distinct parts. Uh, let's say A set of partitions of N into odd parts. B of N into distinct parts. Define a map, say, uh, phi. I'm going to define a map. Is uh, defined as follows. I'm going to give you this map, definition of the map, using uh, example. Mm, seven, one, two, three. Seven dots, seven, seven, five, three, 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 one, one. So this is in AN. Everything is odd. I'm going to construct a uh, partition with distinct parts. So I'm going to uh, rearrange these dots. You just the first, uh, right, the uh, first row, dots in the first row, second. And then instead of aligning them left justified way, I'm going to align them in a center line. And because every uh, part is an odd integer, we can do that. So five will be aligned like this. Center aligned, like that. Three, three, one, and one. All right, and then I'm going to read uh, the dots in this way. Read this. How many dots are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. And then in this way, the, in the opposite direction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the alternating way. One, two, three, four, five, six. Three and one. So this partition seven, seven, five, three, 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 one, one corresponds to this new new partition ten, seven, six, three, one. You can see here they are distinct. In fact, that's not difficult to see because we first do this and then do this. They have to be uh, distinct. But why is this a bijection? That's not uh, clear. Right? You can construct the inverse map. You can show that this is indeed a bijection. 
because actually this map is quite easy, but the inverse map, if you are not given this diagram but only this, you have to think a little bit how, how to arrange this in this way. That's not completely obvious, but there is a way to do this. So construct the by inverse map is a homework problem. So it is uh, indeed a bijection, so it proves that they are, their cardinalities are the same. Inverse map uh, is a homework problem. Finding the inverse map is homework problem. So it is a bijection, so they have the same cardinality. It proves the statement. Uh. Okay, I'm going to erase this. <laughs> Thank you. So this corresponds to this. <laughs> Other mistake? <laughs> All right. Uh, And to so in partition theory, so partitions are, are very interesting in combinatorics because of this nature. There are many, many things that we can do combinatorially. So this has two different proofs. One, one using generating function, another one using combinatorial argument or bijection. So there are many um, uh, uh, famous identities known in Q series or number theory, and many of them can be proved combinatorially like this, but not all of them. There are famous identity called uh, Rogers Ramanujan identity, which is a uh, theorem which is known to be true, but uh, so no combinatorial proof is known so far. I mean, satisfying combinatorial proof. Simple like this. Okay, uh, we will see uh, one more example. Combinatorics, which is very interesting in combinatorics and also uh, computing um, partition. Euler's pentagonal number theorem. So the theorem is the following. Product i this is equal to uh, n from minus infinity, infinity minus 1 to n. OK, this is not uh, the usual way of writing a, f a formal power series. But it is OK. It is because a valid one. If you want, you can rewrite this in this way, which is uh, more familiar with us. They're the same. Plus 1 over 2. So it is OK. So this is called uh, Euler's pentagonal number theorem. Because these numbers are, are pentagonal numbers. Uh, An, let's define An uh, to be this. So A0 equals 0. If you compute, A2 A equals 5, A3 equals 12, A4, 22, etc. Uh, and these are called pentagonal number because they can be obtained by computing penta pentagons. So zero, you successively compute pentagons with 
the, the, here is a pentagon where we have two dots in each side. Here we have three dots in each side by adding, so we can add one more. Okay, let's see, add one more. Two, three, four, one. Right? So we have this pentagon which has uh, four sides, uh, four dots in each side, etc. So you compute the number of dots here. It's going to be 0, 5, and here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then if you compute this more, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 more, so 22, etc. They are the same as this. So this is why it's called the pentagonal number theorem. Uh, pentagonal number, pentagonal number. It's called pentagonal number. Triangular number is defined similarly like this. And that's why its name is pentagonal number theorem. We want to show this combinatorially. It's a very there is a very interesting argument to prove this. First step is to represent this as a generating function for partitions. So proof. Left hand side. What is the left hand side? We have something minus, but let's just pretend that this is just plus. 1 plus q to the i. Have you seen this generating function, this uh, series before? This is a generating function for something. What is that? Uh, distinct part. Partitions into distinct part. But we don't have that. Uh, we don't have plus here, but we have instead minus. Mm, you can still. Uh, write this as a generating function for distinct parts. So it is a distinct part. Let me write this way. Partition with distinct parts. So we have infinite sum. If we don't have minus here, we would have this. But instead, we have minus. So what do, when do we get minus sign here? If we select part equal to i, then we will get one minus sign. So, how many minus ones are there if you have a partition? The number of parts, which is the length. Right? Because whenever you select one part, that will contribute minus one to your effect. This is a generating function. So I, I told you, the generating function for this thing for some object means we add something for each object. It can be anything. You can have minus sign, you can have Q, you can even have it can be even a polynomial or more complicated things like rational function, anything. Now let's rewrite this in this way. M because this is Q to the M for some M. I can we can collect this in this way. Q to the M. Q, M, uh, distinct, partition of M distinct into distinct parts, and minus 1 to L of L, L of lambda. All right? Is this okay? I just rewrote this by collecting uh, terms with the same power of Q. So this, uh, we will regard this as a sign, this as sign of, sign means one or minus one. We will think of this as a sign, sign sum. So instead, add, instead of computing all the numbers, we uh, have a sum plus one or minus one. But for every partition, we either add one or minus one. That's basically the idea. Right, what now? We want to compute this. That's the idea. Eventu uh, interestingly, most of this will be zero. And only a few, although infinite, only few of these will be non-zero, which are one or minus one. Most of them will be zero. There, may, there are lots of cancellation, in other words. 
Any question? That's the idea. We, we will uh, do this. So let me uh, let me uh, just just an example. M equals three. How many partitions of three are there into distinct parts? Three, two, one, two, one and so. <laughs> what do we do here? What is the sign of this <coughs> partition? So minus one to the number of parts, which is one. So it's minus one. What is this? One. one. So you, if you add this, we get zero. That means. The coefficient of this, we just showed that q cubed here we have to have zero coefficient, right? So in this way, for a fixed m, you can compute this by listing all partitions of m into distinct parts and by adding their signs. Can you compute q to the fourth? Yeah, you can compute this. Yeah. Everything for any fixed integer, you can just compute this by listing all of them. But they will not give you directly uh, the general answer. So we want to do something. Mm, let's do one more time for m equals 5. So it's a pentagonal number, so may, we must have something non zero. 5, right? And distinct parts 4, 1, and 3, 2. That's all? So what do we add for this partition? Minus 1, because the sign is minus 1. Here, 2, uh, one. 1, 1. So if you add them, then you get 1. That's why we, so here we have non-zero coefficient for 5. That's, uh, that's the idea. So we want to show this in general. So fix M and let uh, x be the set of all partitions of m with distinct parts. So basically, this is uh, x and m equals 3, right? So these are x and m equals 4, etc. We want to consider this. How? So here, it, let's, so the idea is this: because one minus one plus minus one is zero, uh, we will uh, combine these together. Then their contribution will be zero because one is one, the other one is minus one. Here, you you may uh, combine these. There are different ways to combine these, but we will find one way to combine two di di different parts, uh, different partitions with different sign so that their sum is zero. And we will end up getting only one thing, which is not matched with anything else. So th this will give us the answer at the end. That's the idea. So this kind of uh, map is called sign reversing involution. We define a sign reversing. This is very. Uh, useful technique in dealing with, when we, de when we deal with uh, signed sum, involution on x. It, this means, that is, you're going to define a map, say, phi, from x to x. Mm. Involution means, uh, if you compose this twice, it will be the identity map, such that involution means this equals identity. Or for all x, this is what involution means. And if phi of lambda is mu, is distinct, different then the sign of lambda is different from the sign or minus say minus because different means minus their signs are different 
we will we want to construct the in map like this. This means it reverses the sign. And it is an involution and reverses the sign. That's what sign reversing involution means. And let uh, fix of phi denotes the set of fixed points, meaning set of x such that it is fixed by this involution. Okay. Right. Suppose we, we haven't defined this yet, but suppose right now we have such a sign reversing involution. What is, what is it good for? Suppose we have uh, this involution. Then, if we have such an involution, sum over all lambda, sine of lambda, or, yeah, this is sine, is equal to what? You don't have to look at all of this. You only need to look at the fixed point. Sum over all lambda in the fixed point of phi. This is good because we will have less uh, elements here than this. This is huge set, but this will be very small. Then this is easier. So the idea, in basically, idea is something like this. We have x. The whole set is x. Some of these are fixed. And for other things, by this map, this will be matched by this involution fee. They will be, they will have, my, one will have minus one, one will have plus one, something like that. So they will cancel, like we have over here. So this is in fact fixed. We don't have, it, so if there is no fixed point, that means it will be zero. If this is empty, it will be zero. So most of the time, we will have zero here. This is the uh, idea of the proof. Any question? Okay, so how can we find such an involution, sign reversing involution? Uh, so I'm going to tell you using um, just example, eight dots. Suppose we have three, four, five, six, seven, Remember that we lambda is a partition with distinct parts. So partition with distinct parts. So in X, we will define uh, phi, phi of lambda. In a, some, some way, right? The idea is this. Because it's a distinct partition, you cannot have uh, a dot strictly below this. So you uh, look at uh, the last dot in the first row, and then you look at this diagonal line, and then count how many dots there are. How many dots in this diagonal line are there? Three. So it's going to be three. Okay? And compare this with the last part, two. And the idea is move uh, one of the set of, uh, okay. set of, let's say, uh, red dots or blue dot uh, to the other side. Not very precise, but it will be clear if I do that. So either you move this over here or you move this over here. But the thing is, only one is possible. Only one way is possible. For instance, you cannot move this over here because it's not going to be a partition into distinct parts. But you can move this here. 
You see why? So lambda mu, uh, I think I need more space. So uh, let me copy this. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 5, 6, 2, 3, 4. So move these dots. Uh, let me. <coughs> so we have selected these, and these dots will be moved to this. So this is going to be a uh, phi of lambda. All right. This is an involution because. Now, you, you want to apply phi again to this. You compare this with this. You can either move this here or this down. If you, want, if you move this up, it's not going to be a partition. So you have to move this back over here. So it's an involution. Does it reverse the sign? It always reverses the sign because it always changes the number of parts by one. Either the number of parts is decreased by one or increased by one. And sign reversing. It is a sign reversing involution. So we found a sign reversing involution. We have to look at its fixed points. Okay, let's say in this way. If possible, if possible, we move this. Otherwise, just leave it as a fixed point. If not possible, we define lambda, a phi of lambda to be just lambda. So if this operation is impossible, then it's going to be a fixed point. So we want to find those uh, in which this operation is impossible. In fact, we can always do this, except the following two examples. We can always do this uh, operation unless lambda is of this form. Uh, I think I have too many. Yeah. Let's let's see what this is. We look at this and we look at this. Okay. Suppose we want to move this down. This is not going to be a partition. If you want to move this down up here, it's not a partition. It's impossible. Also this. So they are the same, if they are the same, like this, sharing one, 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 one thing. So this is 4, this is 5, 1 bigger than this. Again, if you want to move this here, it is a partition but not distinct. 1, 2, 3, 4, if you move 1, 2, 3, 4 here, this is now gone. So 4, 4. It's not a partition into distinct parts. And this cannot be moved over here. You can show that these are only possibilities for fixed points, this kind of thing. So here, uh, this is n, and n. So like this is a square. Or square and dots like this, and square and dots with n, n minus 1, etc. n minus 1, n minus 2, etc. Only these are. Uh, fixed point. These are only fixed point. So if n is this, and how many dots are there? n squared plus 
uh, 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 n minus 1, which is uh, n n minus 1, 2. This n squared, n n plus 1 over 2, these are exactly what we have there. Number of parts is n. So these are the fixed points. So we have, uh, actually, th that's basically it. Any question about this? Are you uh, convinced with this proof? Oh yeah, that's right. So, if you rewrite this, I think three. Let's see. Three. This n three n minus one, right? But this one is not quite the same. But I I rewrote if you want if you remember in this way. So yeah. So these are the fixed points, and this is the sign. This is only, these are the only things that are left after the cancellation. That gives us the right-hand side in our uh, thing. So actually, if I have to write the finish, I have to finish. So the left-hand side is equal to, uh, oh, or, okay, I defined x. So summation lambda in x uh, sine of lambda summation lambda in the fixed point of phi. This is either uh, here. If lam uh, m equals this, it is going to be minus 1, minus 1 to the n. So it's minus 1 to the n if m is, we, 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 have, we let uh, x to be the set of uh, partitions of n into distinct parts. So 3n and minus 1. This is what we showed, and zero otherwise. That means the left-hand side is the sum over m, q to the m. It was this, sine of lambda. So it is the right-hand side in our equation because of this. So this kind of movement of dots is uh, very useful too. So many uh, partition identities, I mean, me identities involving partitions can be proved uh, in this way, moving dots around or, sep or uh, decompose a partition diagram, first diagram, and then combine them in a different way, like doing puzzle. But, uh, so it is an interesting problem to prove or combinatorial, to find a combinatorial proof of a identity that is uh, proved uh, di different different way. I mean, there are still many papers uh, written t uh, today uh, about combinatorial proofs of partition identities. They are also a very interesting subject. Question? Why are they different? Mm. Look at this. The, the number of dots equals this, which is equal to this. Number of dots here, they are different. So equal to this, if you compute this, you get this. Oh, <laughs> yeah, my mistake. <laughs> oh, yeah, good point. I made a mistake, of course. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, you should correct me if I made a mistake. Yeah, thank you for the correction. Other uh, questions or corrections?
Mm. Oh, yeah, there's a very uh, useful application to partition, computing the partition. We know this. This is a trivial identity, right? Of course, we cancel this, we get one. But what is this? Generating function for partition. And we know this. It's one plus. What is good about this is that most of the terms are zero because we only have pentagonal numbers appearing there or pentagonal or plus or minus. These times, number of pn, qn equals one. Okay? This can be used to compute this recursively. So you multiply these two, we must get one. This means, uh, okay, if you expand for, for the first few terms, it, it is one minus q minus q squared plus. If you uh, write the first few terms, something like that. Now you mu multiply these two. What is the coefficient of q to the n in the expansion? You have to select one here and the other. You can select either one or minus q or minus q square, etc. If you select this, you have to select pn. Right? If you select this, what do you get? We have to select q to the uh, p of n minus 1. And if you select this, here you will select p of n minus 2. If you multiply these two, you get. So it, it is something like that. Da, da, da. It must be 0 if n is greater than 0. So if you move everything except this to the other side, we get p of n is equal to p n minus 1, p n minus 2. P n minus five. It is an infinite, infinite recurrence, recurrence relation. But the nice thing is, for seven, uh, there are only mm, there are not many uh, terms appearing like that. So you can use this to compute P of n recursively. Because, for instance, if you want to compute the 12, you can only look at this part. It's finite, you can compute this finitely many times. Because P of n is very difficult to compute uh, by, if you consider all partitions, this is a very use efficient way to compute P of n. Okay, uh, all right, so I think this is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.